everyone. Thank you for all coming for our third and final scholarly conversations of the semester. My name is Dr. Servet Yatin, and I have the honor of serving as the Provost and Chief Academic Officer of Quincy College. This event was designed by Quincy College's scholarship teaching and learning team to showcase the knowledge and interest of our talented faculty. This year, we learned from scientists, health professionals, literary critics, and historians who also happen to be on faculty at Quincy College. Through these lectures, we got a taste of what Quincy College students experience every day in the classrooms. This event is not just a way to showcase our talented faculty. It's a way for us to say thank you to our community and all of the support you provide us. Before we go on to introduce this evening's speakers, I would like to ask all scholarship teaching and learning team members to stand for a round of applause for putting together this terrific event. Please stand up so we can recognize you. Thank you. I also want to uh, thank some distinguished guests, including one of our Board of Governors, Frank Santoro. And thank you. And we also have a special guest among us, one of our beloved librarian who is retired, enjoying retirement, Janet Lanigan here. Thank you for all you do, and thank you for coming to this important event. Now, a few housekeeping items. Please silence your cell phones for the remaining of the evening. Restrooms are outside near the entrance, and in case of emergency, please follow the red exit signs. Yes, this evening we have three distinguished speakers with question and answer following each speaker. I will have the honor of introducing each individually, but not before I acknowledge President Richard de Cristofaro, an exceptional leader, outstanding community advocate, and a great supporter of this event. Thank you, President de Cristofaro. <laughs> All right, are we ready? Yes. Great. It's my pleasure to introduce Deborah Saterringer. Deborah holds an MA degree in English from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. A longtime Quincy resident, Deb has been a professor of English and Humanities at Quincy College since 2007. She is committed to developing students' critical thinking and writing skills through the joys and challenges of literary analysis. Her recent conference presentations include Style and Silence, writing the unspeakable in war literature, and periodization as metaphor. This evening, she will examine the writings of Toni Morrison, the first African-American woman to earn the Nobel Prize in literature. Please join me in welcoming Professor Seta Ringer, who will bring Toni Morrison's transformative message to life. Dr. Yatin, and thank all of you for supporting the Quincy College Scholarly Conversations program. So I first became interested in um, this topic when I was teaching Toni Morrison's story recitative to one of my Comp 2 classes. And my students were fixated on trying to determine which of the main characters is black and which is white, while I was trying to guide them to considering the reasons for Morrison's intentional omission. Toni Morrison's major literary works date back some 30 to 50 years, but her writing still speaks profoundly to the divisive climate in society today. Despite the many accolades and accomplishments in her prolific career, she actually had to contend with attempts to label her. 
uh, as the first Amer African American author to win the Nobel Prize for Literature, she actually found herself criticized for only writing about black characters. Toni Morrison is far too talented to remain only a recorder of the black side of provincial American life, said one review. Of course, she later quipped that nobody ever criticized James Joyce for writing only about Irish people. <laughs> um, on the other hand, some black critics accused her of only writing narratives favored by the white literary and academic establishment. Neither poll nor any other label aligned with her vision of herself as a writer. In addressing another category that critics attempted to place her in, that of a feminist writer, she had this response. I would never write any ist. I don't write ist novels. I can't take positions that are closed. Everything I've ever done in the writing world has been to expand articulation rather than to close it, to open doors, sometimes not even closing the book, leaving the endings open for reinterpretation, revisitation, a little ambiguity. I detest and loathe those categories. I think it's a question of equitable access and opening doors to all sorts of things. Along with her, um, her success came an expectation that she would be a spokesperson for social and uh, political issues, particularly pertaining to black life in America in the 1970s. However, she was not interested in embracing that mantle other than aesthetically. In her foreword to the novel Sula, she stated, I refuse to explain or even acknowledge the problem of being a black writer as anything other than an artistic one. So it is only through her fiction that she examines the forces by which we divide others from ourselves. Her stated intent to write fiction unencumbered by other people's expectations was understatement at best because her writing defies labels, categories, and predictable patterns at every possible turn. For the purpose of this talk tonight, I just focused on two of her well-known works, her 1973 novel, Sula, and her 1983 short story, Recitative. Um, the plot is one element of Sula that immediately uh, catches one's attention as defying predictable patterns because it does not follow conventional chronological patterns, what we, uh, uh, progression, what we sometimes refer to as a linear plot. Uh, rather, she opts for a narrative which moves forward as it simultaneously reverts back in time, what we sometimes refer to as a circular or recursive plot. And this structure aligns perfectly with her aesthetic principles of reinterpretation and revisitation and underlines her belief that no single story is ever true or complete. So in revisiting the narrative uh, in the circular pattern, we get different interpretations of it and different perspectives towards it. So the novel Sula traces the journey of two young girlfriends, Sula and Nell, from childhood to adulthood. And the trajectory of the novel uh, revolves around two key incidents in their story, in their, in their friendship. The first of which occurs when they are about 12 years old. And it's a, a case of mischief turned tragedy. They are playfully uh, teasing a little boy um, on the banks of a river. His name is Chicken Little. He's about six years old. And Sula is swinging him around by his hands, and he slips out of her hands and goes flying into the river. And the girls are waiting for him to resurface, which, of course, he never does. And the incident from that point on, every time the narrative refers to it, Morrison refers to it as the closed place in the water or the something newly missing. 
So in their panicked reaction, each girl adopts a posture which shapes the dynamic of their relationship from that time forward. Sula collapsed in tears. She's the one, remember, who was uh, swinging uh, the little boy. And ironically convinced that she had done nothing, uh, Nell tries to calm Sula and with a reassurance that thinly veils disavowal of any responsibility. She says to her friend, you didn't mean it, it ain't your fault. It should be noted that neither does anything to report the tragic mishap, but instead focuses on potential consequences for themselves. So each forms a one-dimensional single story uh, about their respective roles in the drowning incident, which they carry throughout their lives along with their shared secret. It is not until 43 years later uh, when Sula has died and Nell is 55 that uh, she encounters a challenge to her, her long-held uh, belief in her moral superiority. Sula's grandmother, Eva, who is depicted as somewhat of an omniscient character, uh, just out of the blue, asks her, tell me how you killed that little boy. And the accusation forces Nell uh, to confront a truth which she has long avoided. And she thinks back uh, and asks, asks herself, why didn't I feel bad when it happened? So the truth emerges only through the synthesis of and reconsideration of fixed <laughs> narratives. And as Eva declares her, pat, her final judgment on them, just alike, both of you. So in essence, their stories are both uh, one. Um, after that incident that occurs when they're 12 years old, the two uh, grow to, through teenage years and uh, become very different women. Um, Nell becomes the more traditional woman, uh, marrying and having three children, while Sula challenges every possible social norm and lives what Morrison calls an experimental life, so, which leads to the second, much more divisive incident that occurs later in the, friend, in the friend's lives when the unmarried Sula commits the unpardonable sin of um, seducing Nell's husband, Jude. There may, it may be difficult to conceive of more than one way of uh, perceiving or viewing such a, a betrayal, but the narrative again always avoids absolute categories of good and evil. In talking about her creation of the character um, of, of Sula, Morrison stated, she could be used as a classic type of evil force, but at the same time, I didn't want to make her freakish or repulsive or unattractive. And she does this in interesting ways, because even though Sula quickly ditches Jude as soon as she's slept with him and she ditched him for others and moves on, uh, she still becomes the town pariah for betraying her best friend. But in keeping with Morrison's approach of always transcending the simplistic either-or dichotomy, Sula inadvertently becomes a force for good in the community because others who have perhaps been remiss or negligent in taking care of their homes and families suddenly want to distance themselves from her uh, physically and morally, and they suddenly become these upright citizens and take great care now of their, uh, of their children and their families. And interestingly, uh, to emphasize the beneficial effect she has on the community, it's actually kind of funny that uh, Morrison reverses it upon Sula's death, because when Sula dies, then they go back to their old ways of you know, being kind of lowlifes. <laughs> so, um, in another way in which she transcends the, uh, the um, either-or dichotomy is in a deathbed scene with, uh, with Sula. So despite the betrayal about three years after uh, uh, Sula uh, seduced Nellie's husband, um, 
she hears that Sula is terminally ill and for old time's sake goes to see her. And of course the, um, the question, the long unspoken question then is finally asks, asked. And she asks Sula, appealing to the past and that you know, we were such good friends, how come you did it, Sula? And once again, there is an unexpected reaction because it turns out that Nell is not the only injured party because Sula then asks her, if we were such good friends, how come you couldn't get over it? So she dies shortly after that and it is only at Sula's funeral that Nell has an epiphany in which she realizes that the loss which he, she has really been lamenting is not that of her husband, but of her old childhood friend. All that time, all that time, I thought I was missing Jude, but we was girls together. So as in the drowning incident, two seemingly contradictory uh, narratives uh, end up converging. Um, to reinforce the theme that we see in the main characters, there are other characters in Sula who also defy moral absolutes. The early parts of the novel focus on the aforementioned Eva, but earlier in her life, before she is a grandmother, when she is raising her own family. And her son, her only son, Plum, had returned home from uh, permanently damaged from his service in World War I and comes home a heroin addict. And anticipating what his future will be like and realizing that he will never attain self-actualization, but will always be dependent on drugs and on her, Eva burns him to death as he sleeps. He is in, his, in a narcotic stupor one night sleeping. She goes down and holds him and is crying and lovingly thinks of him as a child, and then pours kerosene on him and burns him to death. In a later incident, also involving fire, um, she is looking out the window, her third floor window, and she sees her daughter Hannah uh, lighting a fire to cook food, and her dress, Hannah's dress catches on fire, and in a futile attempt to save Hannah, Eva dives out of the third floor window, injuring herself, and of course failing to save Hannah. So the deaths of two children by fire, one intentional and one accidental, seems to stretch credulity. It's, you know, how, how does this happen? So the purpose, though, that Morrison has is clear. By juxtaposing the two deeds, she is suggesting that it's difficult, if not impossible, to categorize Eva, because the same motivation paradoxically motivates both acts, her maternal impulse, her love for her children. And this sort of uh, anticipates what later happens in, uh, in Beloved, the idea of, of a woman uh, killing her, her child to, uh, to spare her from, uh, from pain. Um, Eva also takes in foster children in one year uh, I think it mentions 1921, she takes in three markedly different boys. One is, uh, one is black, one's half Mexican, one is a white freckled boy with red hair. Uh, she decides they're all six years old, despite their different ages, ignores their names, and renames each of them Dewey. The people in the community ask her, how are you gonna tell them apart? And Eva replies, what you need to tell them apart for. They's all Deweys. <laughs> so in her, her very uh, nonchalant attitude towards classification by name and age, it's her approach to them actually leads the boys to flourish and attain what Morrison refers to as almost divine status, a trinity with a plural name. So again, even the simple act of naming can limit possibilities. Um, I somehow lost.
lost where I was. Okay, there we go. So uh, 10 years later, as though uh, to balk at her own classification as a novelist, Morrison writes her only short story, Recitative. Everything else had been uh, novels. Uh, Recitative repeats many of the patterns uh, that we are now familiar from, from Sula. Uh, once again, it's, uh, the focus is on the relationship of two girls founded on a shared childhood trauma. The story traces uh, their journey. These, these girls are named Twyla and Roberta from childhood to adulthood. Once again, she follows a recursive pattern. Uh, forward movement is accompanied by uh, reverting back to the past to a pivotal incident. And it is tension, once again, tension over conflicting versions of this pivotal incident that ultimately progresses towards unity. Of Sula, Morrison had stated that her intent was to portray Sula and Nell as two halves of one person. I wanted to say that there was a little bit of both in each of those two women. And she again takes the same approach with Twyla and Roberta. Unlike Sula and Nellie, who had grown up together, Twyla and Roberta meet and bond in the four months that they spend together as roommates in St. Bonnie's orphanage. The two eight-year-olds share a unique status at the orphanage because they're the only ones who aren't orphans. Both have living mothers who cannot take care of them. First person narrator Twyla states, uh, my mother danced all night and uh, Roberta's was sick. So she goes on to say, we weren't real orphans with beautiful dead parents in the sky. We were dumped. Uh, if the duality in Sula revolved around the relative moral character of the two girls, Sula and Nell, the duality in, re in recitative is more explicitly Rachel, uh, Rachel, excuse me, um, because uh, Twyla says, we looked like salt and pepper standing there, and that's what the other kids called us sometimes. But after sta making, having Twyla make that statement, Morrison explicitly withholds any definitive clues to the girl's respective racial identities. In talking about her writing of the story, she stated that the story was specifically intended as an experiment in the removal of all racial codes from a narrative about two characters of different races. She scoffs at the attempts, any attempts to definitively determine the girl's races because she felt that the misguided focus on race overlooked the girl's shared story of neglect, a narrative which transcended boundaries of race. In this case, uh, the pivotal incident involves something that happened with the deaf-mute kitchen worker, Maggie, uh, at the orphanage. Says Twyla, Maggie fell down once and the big girls laughed at her we should have helped her up, I know, but we were scared of those girls with lipstick and eyebrow pencil. After the four months, the girls go their separate ways, leaving St. Bonnie's orphanage at different times, but the Maggie incident becomes central to four random encounters between Twyla and Roberta that take place over a loosely defined period of time, but approximately a 20-year period. The increasingly tense encounters uh, reflects the girls' different memories of that incident, specific, specifically revolving around Ma Maggie's racial identity, whether she fell or was pushed, and who pushed her. Was it the older, tough girls, or was it Roberta and Twyla themselves? Separately, each girl comes to realize the unity of their versions in exactly the same language, in identical language. Um, and they both attain uh, self-awareness, self-knowledge, realizing that they did not hurt Maggie, but that projecting their absent mothers to the character of Maggie made them want to hurt her. They own the misplaced pain they have been directing at each other. Each abandons her fixed single story, and once again, the two narratives become one. In repeating these patterns 10 years apart, Morrison is essentially modeling the reconsideration and revisitation 
of a fixed narrative that she is urging. For only the conclusions of the two parallel journeys really distinguish them, with recitative succeeding where Sula fails. Nellie realizes oneness with her friend too late after Sula's death, and so the novel ends in circles of sorrow. But the synthesis of Twyla's and Roberta's narratives, while both are still alive, allows empathy and outreach beyond themselves. Roberta now cares about the effect that her misrepresentation of the Maggie incident may have had on Twyla, saying, I don't want you to carry that around. And in her final lines, crying through it the whole way, sincerely asks, what the hell happened to Maggie? So recitative ends on a note of acceptance, re reconciliation, and forward movement. Ultimately, Morrison's vision is not without conflict and difference. Critic Zadie Smith states that Morrison's humanism is a radical one which struggles toward solidarity in alterity, the possibility and promise of unity across difference. Morrison posits that life is conceptually dominated by binaries, but never wholly contained by them. Tension need not be divisive. It can be creative. Reimagining a limiting, unquestioned narrative makes forward movement possible. As Eva asks about her three foster boys, what you need to tell them apart for. And there's Toni Morrison. Any quick questions? I know I probably went a little bit over, so uh, just, yes. So uh, the first event, Sula, was the uh, incident of fire used to contrast to the incident of drowning, fire versus water. So uh, that, that is an interesting point, and she does, Morrison does use those elements a lot. But in, in this case, it was, I think it's more, uh, she wanted to contrast and juxtapose the two fire incidents. Um, you know, how, how do you burn a, a, a child to death? But it's that same, that same desire to actually thinking of the child that governed her, uh, her attempt to, to rescue um, to Hannah. Um, there's, there's other interesting, she, Marson explores maternal ideas a lot too. And, um, uh, other interesting aspect of, of Eva is um, that when she had been left to fend for children, uh, her husband had left her and she had children on her own, she actually has, uh, sticks her leg on a railroad track and uh, has the train run over and she collects and that's how she gets money to support her family. Yes. And then, uh, did the grandmother actually uh, know something about the, the death of the, the Yes, it, tur it turns out that she does. There is, I didn't mention, because there's too many characters, right. but there's another character, Shadrach, who is kind of the local eccentric, and he was the one potential witness uh, to the drowning, and it suggested that uh, Eva perhaps learned something from him. Yes, Steve. So, uh, the title kind of recipe is, is that like the musical recitative? Yes. How does that uh, figure in the story? So it's interesting because it's it's a term that's used for um, music, like oratorio and opera, in which um, it, the, the definition is actually many words being repeated on the same note. And so that in itself comes to be another image of uh, diversity converging and creating harmony. Anything else? Okay, thank you. Thank you, Professor Sederinger. It was a great enlightening uh, presentation. I learned a lot. Um, we all know that the world changes at a dizzying pace. This is certainly true in the world of medicine. It is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Michael Yanessa, who holds a medical doctor degree from the University of Rome, 
finishing his schooling with a surgical internship and OBGYN residency. Dr. Yanessa has served as the medical director in two organizations. He focused on women's health at Women's Healthcare Associates for over 30 years, with participation in thousands of births and hundreds of surgeries. After that, um, he spent five years specializing in addiction medicine and helping patients at the High Point Treatment Center. Dr. Yanessa built upon his success by turning to teaching in 2015 when he started as an adjunct professor here at Quincy College. Tonight, please welcome local obstetrician and gynecologist and Quincy College Natural and Health Sciences faculty member, Dr. Michael Yanessa. Gets things ready. Uh, you know, I want to thank President Christopher and Provost Jatton, and our wonderfully supportive board member Frank, esteemed colleagues and staff, and especially any students and members of the Quincy community. Welcome. Thank you for the opportunity to address you today. It's an honor to be chosen as a participant in this speaker series, and I'd like to talk to you about a couple whom I delivered in 1992 whose husband and father was infertile, with no sperm, and how science was able to overcome his problem of conceiving his own child. So, I have so many stories I could talk about, but I picked a fun one. Um, now, yeah, let's see. Okay, um, not to brag, but I want to tell you about, um, while I was at LSU uh, in Charity Hospital in New Orleans, there were over 50,000 babies born. And um, at the end of my residency, I was awarded with a plaque on the wall that said that I was recognized for achieving the fact of delivering 24 babies in 24 hours. And it still stands. As, um, it, I'm, I'm saying it only because the world has changed so radically. That would never happen again. Um, I'm just going to tell you a memorable story about a twin. These are, this is a twin story, and these are not the real people because I can't show you the real people. <laughs> so what's our case history? We have a 28-year-old woman who's never had a baby who presents to me with primary infertility. She can't conceive. She was found to have normal hormones, normal examination, she was ovulatory, she had no luteal phase defect, she had a normal endometrial biopsy and a normal postcoital test. However, her husband was found to be azospermic. That is, he had no modal sperm. No dead sperm, no sperm at all. On two separate samples done on two separate occasions three months apart. So, that's a problem. Um, I'm not gonna show you the video. But in order to understand advanced reproductive technologies, you got to understand the normal. The normal way fertilization occurs is that the sperm meets the egg through intercourse, and the sperm travel through the uterus down to the tubes. The fallopian tube captures the ovary, uh, the egg from the ovary, and um, fertilization occurs in the fallopian tube, normally and naturally. And it takes about seven days for the fertilized egg to grow, develop into what's called a blastocyst and implant in the uterus. That's normal fertilization. Or we would call it in vivo fertilization because in real life, it's happening. What um, is happening essentially, while the fertilization is occurring and the cells are growing and developing, two cells, four cells, eight cells, a more or less stage of blastocyst forms, and then the implantation occurs when it's this blastocyst form about a week later. Um, and that's normal. Now, what's in vitro fertilization? If that's the in vivo fertilization in real life, in vitro comes from the word vitro, like a glass, because they used to call it a test tube baby. 
because they thought it was, you know, somehow a, th helped by science through test tubes. In fact, it's a plastic petri disk dish, but not a test tube. Um, but how does it work? <laughs> Basically, it's a busy site. Don't read it. Um, what happens is you need one egg and one sperm to have a fertilization. Well, if you can have lots of eggs and lots of sperm, you increase the risk or chances of fertilization occurring. So what do they do? They get a woman and they ask her, if you're willing to go through all this, you need to have lots of close follow-up testing and be really committed to this. So we test ovarian reserve. Now, a woman is born with all the eggs she's going to have all in her life at the moment of birth. She's got all the eggs she's ever going to need. Each month, one particular egg grows to maturation and gets released. But in that process, somewhere between 8 and 10, sometimes as many as 20, eggs can develop. But the body has a way of suppressing that. And that's a normal, natural thing. So what happens is in vitro fertilization tries to get those 10 eggs to grow. And so they're not disturbing her long-term potential of having children because they're not in any way doing any more than allowing the normal, natural 10 that would normally be there. Instead of there being suppression of those 10, all 10 of them they want to grow. So what they do is they start by suppressing everything. You have to know exactly where you're starting from, so they turn everything off. They could turn everything off with ovulation blockers, with birth control pills, um, but basically they suppress first. And then they stimulate. They stimulate all of them to grow, um, and in order to do that, they've got to do every two to three days an ultrasound and check the woman's ovarian reserve. They do an antral follicle count, and they check a blood test called the anti-mullerian hormone. Now, in addition to the suppression and stimulation, monitoring has to occur. Lots and lots of monitoring every two to three days. So it's a very stressful time for the woman. But ultimately, they try to get the woman to produce upwards of 10 follicles. Now, at a certain point, they trigger the release of those follicles. How do they do that? Well, they either ask the woman to do it or she comes in and just gives herself a shot. And the shot is really human chorionic gonadotropins, which is the same stuff that pregnancy measures when a person becomes pregnant. There is a measurement done called human chorionic gonadotropin. Well, they're giving this and it works more at this point like luteinizing hormone than it does like um, HCG. So basically, this is another busy slide, but the whole thing to take away with this is the embryo, they have lots and lots of follicles grow. And then they essentially cause a hyperstimulation of the ovary. At the time, with our patient, the only way they could then recover the eggs was laparoscopically. So this is in 1992. Remember, IVF began in about 1978. By 1992, it was starting to become very popular, very understood, very much used. OK, so what, this is an example of uh, a laparoscopy where I'm going to you just put a lighted scope inside the belly button, a little teeny, tiny uh, lighted tube, and you grab the uh, ovary, and then you, with a needle, remove the follicles. And um, so they filled everything with gas. And it was pretty cumbersome and pretty uh, difficult, but now, now, They've got a way of recovering this uh, with a transvaginal 
a needle that can just she's put to sleep and then they take the follicles out transvaginally without it having to go through a laparoscopy. But so now that you understand that they need to get lots of follicles, then what do they do? One of two things. They take a bunch of sperm and they put them in a petri dish with the follicles. And this is called conventional fertilization by IVF. The probability of a successful development of a fertilized egg with conventional fertilization is about 60%. So right around 1985, they came up with the idea of implanting a sperm directly into the follicle. And this is called um, intracytoplasmic sperm injection. Or we, we refer to it as ICSI. With ICSI, there's about a 75% chance that fertilization will occur, even as high as 80%. Okay, so now you've got lots of eggs, lots of sperm, and the coming together of them for a fertilized egg. And I don't know if we have time for this. Let's go. Now we go back to our patient. What's the difference between aspermia and azospermia? Aspermia means he has no ejaculate at all. He gets no, um, nothing comes out when he has an ejaculation. Um, sperm or fluid, nothing. That's aspermia. Um, azospermia, what comes out is this kind of fluid, but there's nothing in it. So you look under the microscope and you do a semen analysis. You look under the microscope and you see no sperm um, in someone who's azospermic. So our patient was azospermic. OK, what's our hypothesis here? The researchers suggested that perhaps they could try doing a testicular biopsy and see if they could find some sperm in my patient, whose husband had no sperm. Around 1990, in vitro fertilization began in earnest, and they thought if they could find even one sperm and extract it and fertilize one of her eggs, perhaps they could replant the embryo. So basically, the idea of testicular sperm extraction was started and has since become a very important procedure for, for um, infertile men. So there is now a procedure that's regularly known as testicular sperm extraction, where they can look for sperm independent of ejaculation. And this is where they would look for it because um, that's where the sperm are produced. In the same time, with ovulation induction and egg retrieval, it's become much more um, routine. And here's our problem. The husband was insistent, and he was very persistent. He would have a child at all costs. He would not hear of being infertile. He asked, he begged, he cajoled, he refused to consider adoption, sperm donation, would not even consider having a biological child of their own. He absolutely would not consider not having a child that wasn't his own. Because of his persistence, I was persuaded to call the researchers at Boston IVF uh, through Beth Israel Deaconess and ask what could be done. So I called up Michael Alper. Michael actually is one of the two people who actually started Boston IVF. And Boston IVF is one of the most successful uh, programs in the world. Um, and so it was nice to know Michael. And I said, Michael, listen, I got a husband who doesn't have any sperm, but he's willing to, to do anything. And so at the same time, 
this is all how science works. At the same time, there's a guy named, uh, he pointed out to me, you know, Michael, we could think about doing a testicular biopsy. He recalled a paper from 1940 that said, um, testicular biopsies are still something we can think about, because they hadn't even thought about a biopsy at that point. So Dr. Alper was persuaded, after some cajoling, to take the, this challenge up. He reminded me of Dr. Chain, uh, Charney's paper from 1940 describing testicular biopsy. He suggested we try seeing if testicular biopsy yielded the possibility that something could be injected to his uh, wife's eggs and transfer her. Now, what's the important thing that happened at the same time? A guy named Jean-Pierre Palermo in Belgium was considering doing testicular biopsies at the exact same time. He was so excited about the possibility of having a patient that he could work with because he's been doing it himself that he was transferred and they, to Cornell. And they asked him, come over to Cornell and be our reproductive endocrinologist. And so Michael calls Jean-Pierre and the two of them decide, all right, I got one for you. We're gonna do a testicular biopsy and it's just up your alley because you've got patients right now you're thinking about doing testicular biopsies with. And that's Dr. Uh, Palermo, who is still at Cornell. Um, but at the time, these guys were much younger. <laughs> All right. This was what happened was, this was published as the very first time in history that a testicular sperm extraction was done. On my patient, because of the persistence of the father to have a biological child, and on three of Dr. Palermo's patients. So, um, this is what intracytoplasmic sperm injection looks like when they do it. Um, you can see he actually catches the sperm, but it's tail first. That's no good. So he has to put it back. Mm -hmm. So now he puts it and he wants the tail in and the head first. Okay, so now we've got the head of the sperm ready. And so now we've got to inject this. They originally thought maybe they should do it subzonally, which means there's a zona pellucida around the egg. And if you just kind of stick it in, maybe it'll work, but it didn't. So they had to go all the way into the egg itself. But the egg's moving all over the place. How are they gonna get this intracytoplasmic sperm to get injected into the egg? They're gonna use a tiny little suction and they're gonna get that follicle to get sucked a little bit. See how it's getting sucked a little bit? Just so he could hold it still. And at the same time, now he's got a follicle and he goes right into the follicle with a sperm called intracytoplasmic sperm injection. And we took testicular tissue not absolutely certain that there were sperm in it of my patient's husband. And it goes right in. And then since it's head first, he just injects it. And you hope 75, 80% chance that it fertilizes. That's intracytoplasmic sperm injection. And we did it with our patient. <coughs> and what happened? We ended up with four fertilizable eggs from the testicular biopsy. And much to our amazement, two of them fertilized. And what happens is they develop into this two cell, four cell, eight cell, 16 cell morula and blastocyst over a same amount of week that it takes. And they call this the trophoectoderm. This is the zona pellucida on the outside of the egg and the follicle. This is called the blastocele on the inside. And this is the inner cell mass, which actually becomes the baby. 
And so once you've got the presence of an inner cell mass, you know it's fertilized. And then how do they transfer the fertilized egg? What we do is um, you take um, a speculum and you actually put it right in the cervix and then you inject. In the beginning, we were injecting at such a rate and force that it was measured to be equivalent to a freight train. And so none of them worked because if you're pushing and it kind of smashes into the inside of the lining of the uterus, nothing's going to happen. So we learned that if you inject very, 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 very slowly, it'll kind of implant on its own. But that took a long time to figure out too. But at this point, we didn't know. We just injected. Um, and then this is not to. Sh this is just a little bit of the workup you go for infertile couple. This was D Dr. Elper's one of his original papers in '85, and he's already working on the relationship of semen parameters to fertilization in patients participating in a program of in vitro <laughs> fertilization. And then this was the original paper written and published in Belgium um, by Dr. Palermo, um, surgical sperm extraction, and it went to an obscure journal called Human Fertilization and Embryology. No one heard of it. Okay. And so what did they have to do? They, it was such an important event. This is an infertile husband who has a child on his own. Lancet picked it up. Now, Lancet is equivalent to New England Journal in Europe. And um, Lancet's kind of England's New England Journal of Medicine. So it's a big thing to get into Lancet. So what happened is, this is the way Lancet used to look back in 92. This is the way Lancet looks now. And I'll read this because it's worth it. Now, this is Palermo's original paper. And um, of course, Michael Alper let Dr. Palermo have all the credit, which is the way they work, you know, because you work with those guys, Cornell, Boston, Harvard, you got to do something for them, and next time they'll do something for you. But anyway, intracytoplasmic sperm injection is a promising assisted fertilization technique that may benefit women who have not become pregnant by in vitro fertilization or subzonal insemination. They were still doing the subzonal insemination, meaning they were trying to get into the zona pellucida, but you have to actually go right in in order for it to work. Um, we've used ICSI to treat couples with infertility because of severely impaired sperm characteristics and in whom IVF and subzonal had failed. Direct injection of a single spermatozoan into the ovoplasm was done in 47 metaphase two oocytes. 38 oocytes remained intact after injection, 31 became fertilized, and 15 embryos were repl replaced in utero. Four pregnancies occurred after eight treatment cycles. He ended up with two singletons, both of them boys. And ours was a twin pregnancy. And he had a preclinical abortion too. Two healthy boys have been delivered from the singleton pregnancy, and a healthy boy and girl from the twin. So that's our pregnant patient, and that was the twin pregnancy. And it was published in 92, and it's been a landmark paper in that now they have a way to treat men who are infertile for all kinds of reasons, obstruction, prodarchidism, um, post-articular advances, what they're doing now is just amazing. Um, this is a paper, a few weeks old, where four pregnancies in non-mosaic Kleinfelter syndrome using cryopreserved thaw testicular spermatozoa. That's a male factor in fertility. Kleinfelter syndrome is XXY. Those guys have been unfertile forever. Now they've used testicular sperm um, extraction and fertilization, thawing the eggs after freezing them, and have successful pregnancies from men with Kleinfelters, which is incredible. 
So we've come a long way as a result of all of this. And in fact, right now, there have been more than 10 million babies born since in vitro fertilization started. And it's kind of fun to have been participated, and that's not our twin, but it's a nice picture. Um, and this beautiful couple went to term, delivered both a male and a female twin pregnancy without problems, proving that sex was not always a factor in the process, and delivering one of the first successful pregnancies in the world from a husband who was azospermic. And that's it. <laughs> This is the eight, that's the point at which they actually take them so that they can uh, finish development in um, vitro. Okay, one other thing. Um, I, I noticed in, in the video that you showed that they have to put the sperm in head first, but if they were injecting the sperm all the way into this cytoplasm, it doesn't matter. It really doesn't, but um, they know that the head of the sperm, once it reaches the zone of pellucida, releases something that causes the egg to keep the other guys from coming in. Yeah. And so they generally probably found it more conventional to think of it in terms of going yes. head first. But all the genetic material is in the head anyway, so yeah. they're kind of hoping that that's the right way to do it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We don't really know until you do it and try. Yep. Yes. So if it hadn't worked the first time, do you think you would have had the opportunity to try again? In, in my case, probably not, only because in 1992, this was very experimental. And, and now, without a doubt, but this was, I mean, we had to make arrangements between here and New York, and it was just like, she was so cooperative, and she wanted the baby just as much as he did, and, and it, was, it was such a one-in-a-lifetime kind of thing, I don't think they would have done it again. Um, it was just, it was very stressful. But it was, it worked. It was so cool. And that's how science can change for lots and lots of people, which is really cool. I don't know, I don't know yes. if I have this right in English future, but you said that the sperm and the egg marry in the floating tube. And then it develops over, I think you said, several days. Right. And then finally it implants in the uterus around the corner. Right. When you go into the cervix, it's coming in from a different direction, but implanting in the uterus? Yes. And, and it's at the same blastocyst stage. Oh, it's, so it has developed. It's, it's yes. They wait right. until you're a blast, the, the fertilized egg becomes a blastocyst, about 300 cells. And then they implant it exactly. exactly the same time, about seven days after fertilization. Then they implant. Yep. Um, has there ever been any follow up to find out if these children are genetically traditional, and no. or and or um, are these children able to produce their own sperm? It would be a very good question. I've never been able to follow up. We were just kind of very happy. And they'd be in their 30s now. Um, so they would be able yeah. to produce their own yeah. sperm. Hopefully. Point. And there could be, there's probably no reason not to unless they've inherited, inherited the same condition from the father. Okay. So, um, which they may have. But there's a treatment for it. <laughs> <laughs> Anything else? Okay. Thank you, Dr. Yanessa. It was a great presentation. All right, um, we have all been urged at one time or another to be positive when things don't go our way. Do our thoughts determine what happens to us? We will have opportunity to ask Dr. Ken Texeria. Dr. Texeria earned a PhD in Applied Developmental Psychology from Fordham University. He has written many publications in the fields of personality, health psychology, and bioethics, while dedicating his time and talents to creating supportive communities. He founded a fishing team, coached soccer, and even hosted open mic performance nights for combat veterans to create peer-to-peer -peer 
support networks, reduce isolation, and create positive connections. In addition to his role as a professor at Quincy College and his work with veterans, he currently serves on the board of directors for Silver Lake High School's Allied Health Program. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Ken Texera, who will share with us the wisdom and science of positive thinking. Everyone. I first want to just express my gratitude to be a part of this wonderful uh, dialogue and I'm terrified following our good doctor who he doesn't know I used to actually sit quietly in front of his class just to listen when he was teaching in Plymouth because uh, he's such a dynamic speaker so we're so well just we have great faculty here and I'm grateful and I'm also grateful for just being a part of this community right so these are a couple things that hopefully will help me guide this talk uh, about happiness. So positive psychology is a field that started with Seligman, and it's actually pretty interesting how Seligman came to this. He um, originally studied learned helplessness, so he studied the depths of depression for years and years and years, and then he had an epiphany and kind of discovered that psychology has been great at getting people to go from negative 10 back to their baseline, but how do you folks do if you're already doing well and you're a thriving person, can we get you to seven to maybe nine, right? So positive psychology basically um, is this field of where we try to find human strengths in flourishing. And my um, academic pursuits in research, and I've worked in um, cancer care, and I work with combat vets uh, in different populations, I'm, um, I'll have some really cool examples of some, some findings I have too, just because um, I feel like I have to after he's publishing in The Lancet and such. Um, so the first thing I wanted to talk about was um, positive emotions, uh, engagement and flow, and meaning and purpose in life. So Seligman um, basically is looking at this in three kind of different um, parts. So first I want to talk about positive emotions. Now, if, and you guys can play this with me if you like, right? So on a scale of one to 10, right, thinking about all of the domains of your life, you know, your health, your finances, your relationships, you know, your dreams, your hopes, all things taken together over the past 30 days, how satisfied are you folks with life these days? Anybody want to put your scores up? Let me see. Anybody want to participate? All right, yep, it's got some sevens, a few people. Don't be bashful, it's okay, right? We won't tell on you. Right? So basically what you're doing is this is a cognitive evaluation of your life circumstances. Right? So this is everything taken together cognitively. Now this is one part of hedonics or hedonism. Right? So hedonism is like living a pleasurable life. A life that you, know, you want to have more pleasure versus pain and this is kind of hedonic. So this is the cognitive evaluation. Now if you want to kind of change this, this is an interesting thing. So I asked you about your trait, right? Over 30 days, this is a trait. This is how you usually would be, right? So you can also ask this question over two days. So that's a state. So thinking about those, did your, did your question, you know, maybe you changed because the past couple days um, have been extra good or it's been a little rainy, so it could be a little lower. So you can think about this as a state or a trait, right? And so I was lucky to be able to work with um, a lot of people in end of life care and in um, cancer care. And I was really interested in trying to find happiness where you might not expect to find it. And, and it's fascinating when you, when you work with people that are kind of really going through struggle where you see true human strength. And so this is something that's kind of guided uh, a lot of my research. And these questions are different ones. And if you wanted to actually take this, you can just Google hedonic subjective well-being. This is on a seven point scale and you can see, you know, most in most way, in ways my life is close to ideal. And if you add these all up, you can see if you're extremely satisfied to extremely dissatisfied. So this is one part and this is called the life satisfaction question. But there's another piece. So not to be outdone, I have statistics <laughs> also. 
right? So don't be scared of the, the statistics so much. But the PA is positive affect, so that's positive mood, right? And the negative affect is negative mood. And all of these different pieces from interested, alert, attentive, excited, enthusiastic, inspired, proud, determined, strong, and active, all are on a factor of positive mood. Now, when you experience happiness, right, or sadness, we usually feel like it's on one unitary continuum, right? How you doing, right? And somebody says, oh, I'm happy or I'm sad. But I want to challenge that kind of feeling and realize that there's two separate subsystems in your brain. So you're simultaneously experiencing happiness and sadness all the time at the same time, right? And this will be really useful if you want to start to work with happiness or try to, to change mood, right? Now, the factor loadings here, you see like a 0 0.90 for excited. If you go down to the negative affect, right, we have distressed, upset, guilty, ashamed, hostile, which is a 0.93, right, so very heavy loading. And one of the reasons is, if you look at it in um, the highest one of excited, this is arousal, right, so how much energy you have and that feeling. So that's why it has a heavy factor loading. So this is positive and negative mood. Now again, there's advantages and disadvantages to this model, but this is basically positive and negative affect. So if you take that first question, your cognitive evaluation of your circumstances, and your mood, you have in total subjective well-being, which is basically hedonics and a very useful tool. Now, maybe the good Dr. Ionessa can help me with this. If I could do one thing in healthcare, like if I could make one change and had a magic wand to change something, one thing I would love to be able to use or popularize, uh, for lack of a better term, in healthcare institutions is using mood scales when um, we're working with cancer patients or any kind of patient care. Because here, if you look at positive and negative affect, you can actually kind of stave off depression before you're clinically full-blown depressed, right? So that you can, you can do more kind of fine-tuned things to work with people and patient outcomes. So that's like, we'll talk, <laughs> I hope. <laughs> so that's one of the things that I've been kind of looking at for many years. So this is your positive mood in hedonics, but that's not the only thing. Now here's the problem with the, posi um, the hedonic piece. One, it's very highly heritable, kind of hard to change. And a couple pieces to this that I find absolutely fascinating is if you're an extrovert, you tend to have more positive affect, even when you're by yourself. And the theory for why that is, is that extroverts have a reward system in their brain that's more sensitive. So you're just more sensitive to reward, right? You know, someone's like, hey, you look good today. I'm like, well, I thank you. You just bump me up a notch. Other people, if you're neurotic, you basically have more sensitivity to negativity in your environment. So maybe like, you know, when you, you get to work, you're a little late, and your boss is like, one of these, you know, a little late, like, oh my gosh, right? So you're more sensitive to negativity in your environment. Not, never me, of course, you know, as all my bosses are here, and this is terrifying. Um, <laughs> we do this all the time, you know, it's great. Um, so if you think about those things, extroversion versus neuroticism, so these things are heritable, and the other piece is more hedonism or more pleasure doesn't add. And in fact, actually, pleasure, you get used to it, and then it'll fall off, right? So think about an ice cream sundae. The first three scoops are bliss. And by the time you get to the bottom, you're like, oh, I guess I have to finish it, right? So you can kind of think of it it's like, now I'm sticky. <laughs> you know? so, so just pleasure for pleasure's sake isn't really the crux. Now here's another one. This is Flow by Sidema Ciel. That's how you pronounce that. It has like every vowel consonant in the thing. And what he did was he studied people that were peak performers across all sorts of fields. So he was looking at improvisational musicians. I could, I could kind of see Dr. Ionessa doing surgery as he was talking, right? You could just see his hands, he's in flow. Now, one thing that's interesting about flow is you have to know something about how your brain processes information. Your brain can only process about 193 bits per second. Right? So you can only process so much information at one time. So like if one person is talking to you, no problem. But if two people are talking to you at the same time, it's like, whoa, too much, right? So it's that you can get overloaded. But the advantage with this is if you use this to your advantage and you try to put yourself in a situation where your brain is almost completely enveloped by a task that you have some skill in, right? So that's the challenge skill balance that's up there. So you have enough challenge, 
and enough skill. Now we're in like playoffs and I'm so sad about the Bruins. That kind of hurt my soul. Ugh, not to put your positive mood down, but you know, we still have other teams, right? But have you ever noticed in like regular play during the season, a lot of the players look, they're great, but they're not spectacular, right? But then once the playoffs hit, they just get super hot and you just see this like absolute flow. So the trick here is to try to put yourself in situations where you have the right fit of challenge and your skill. And then you have the peak optimal performance. Another thing is having good goals, a sense of control. Um, and then if you're in flow, time stops. You just, you're just in the zone, right? And um, this is how to live a good life. And, and I challenge you to think about things that you are passionate about or that you enjoy where time just stops for you and you just are lost in it. You know, and I love this autotelic experience, which is just doing something to do it. You know, make a beautiful work of art just to have it. Now, one of my students actually inspired me this week, and, and I was going to put um, this model by uh, Carol Riff, which which talks about well-being in a different way. And psychological well-being is like sense of mastery and sense of purpose. And one of my students said, "Hey, Dr. Tex, have you ever heard of Ikigai?" And I said, no, what is that? And she said, well, it's a Japanese way to kind of say the same thing you're doing. So to be multicultural and kind of um, shout out to my Japanese wife and you know Asian kids, I wanted to say ikigai. So what I like about this is it kind of encapsulates something that is a little bigger. It's, it's eudaimonia. It's living a good life, right? So it's a life that's beyond just pleasure or just being in a zone but how do you live a life that is beyond that? Now, Aristotle said, if we just look at hedonics, we might as well be grazing cattle. So how do we live a good life? And a good life with your ethics and your morals. For me personally, living a good life and, and doing the most I can with my skills and talents is to help other people. And when I do that, I get an overwhelming sense of well-being that's way deeper than maybe a quick vacation or a jaunt on the beach, right? But what I like about this is this is something you can kind of apply to your own life. So you have what you love, right? So this is something that you just love, what you can be paid for, right? <laughs> this is my dad's greatest fear when I entered psychology. He's like, oh no, why can't you get a major that'll make some money? You know, like he's worried about, he's like a very traditional Portuguese guy, right? So it's like, what can you be paid for? What are you good at, right? So you have your skills. And then what the world needs on the other side. Now, if you can blend all of these things, you reach this ikigai, which is, which is that peak performance where you have everything, right? You have your passion, your mission, your profession, and your vocation. And so having these kind of things all blend together, um, this is what I wish for you. And one thing I'm just curious, because I met a couple wonderful people. How many alumni do we have? Awesome. Thanks for coming back, right? And I hope, you know, you wanting to revisit your alma mater is giving you a feeling of, of completion or passion, you know? Um, so I just wanted to thank you. Um, the last thing, a couple like cool findings that I found. I don't want to take up too much of your time if you have questions and stuff. But um, one thing I was able to find in, in cancer care, which was interesting, is Optimism, if you're doing okay, like you're not like in, in long-term treatment or you know have something serious going on, doesn't really move the dial on positive and negative affect or positive mood, but if you have cancer, it does. And if you can think about that, optimism now means something. It has kind of a deeper sense. And there's a couple other things I wanna leave you with that you can do to kind of improve your own mood today. The best one in the most replicable finding is if you write a, gra a gratitude letter to someone, 350 words, and here's the trick. You have to show up to that person and read it to them. You actually have higher mood for a full calendar year. And the person that you read it to, you know, it's like, thanks, you know? <laughs> it's nice. So gratitude. Now, if that's a little too embarrassing or you're not an extrovert, like you can probably tell I am, right? Uh, and you're more of an introvert, even just writing gratitude lists, having a rough day, what are the things you're thankful for, right? Classic, time-tested time ways to be happy. Another thing, and this is a test you can do on yourself, is try to have a pleasant experience, so activate hedonism, and then try to do something philanthropic. 
So doing something for somebody else. And then be mindful and kind of reflect on which one gave you more passion. And, and you can activate these brain systems to be able to kind of rewire your brain to be more, more present or more appreciative when these good things happen. And if you want to know more, um, Google me. You know, sort of a big deal, as they say. Um, the other thing is um, you can always send me an email at kentexair at quincycollege.edu. And if you're interested in some like just videos or any kind of extra psych stuff, I put some like videos that I'll use for classes or just interesting things for psychology on my Instagram page, Dr. Ken Tex at Instagram. And I just want to thank you guys for having me. Yes, sir. I'm just always been curious about words like extrovert. How do you define it? Because quite frankly, my Irish relatives thought they were extroverted until they met my Sicilian relatives. Okay. I mean, so what, what, what does it mean? So the opposite of extroversion is introversion, right? And I have a quick kind of fun test that it's not scientific, but it's kind of cool. This is how I can tell if you're an extrovert or introvert. Friday, Saturday, you have nothing to do. Your best friend rolls up in their car and says, we're going to go to a party. There's going to be 200 people there. I only know the host of the party. How many people are like, giddy up, let's go? I'll see you guys after this, went over to the coffee station. Now, how many other people might be like, oh, no, I got to declaw my cat, or you come up with some, you know? You're like, oh, I don't know. I don't know if I want to go. So extroverts basically recharge with people, and introverts recharge by themselves. And you can actually like see brains of extroverts and introverts and reward them, and extroverts' brains will light up way more in an MRI to a uh, reward system. And that's from like Gray's reinforcement sensitivity theory. But that uh, term was actually originally coined by um, Carl Jung. So that's a good place to look for it. Yes? Is the person necessarily one or the other? Could it be like happiness or sadness coexisting? All the time? Yeah, or even extroversion and introversion, right? You don't have to be like on one side or be on the other side. And here's a kind of an interesting thing. And this is another thought kind of thing I love asking my students. Have you ever felt a time where you are both really happy and really sad at the same time? Yeah. I think it's genetics involved in, uh, in that, in being an extrovert, or do you know if there's any gene for that? Yeah. It's, um, it, somebody said uh, changing your personality would be like a zebra changing their stripes. So it's, it's, um, it's highly stable but changeable is the most kind of agreed upon definition. But back to that question. Um, oh, yeah, you have a question over there. Sorry. Yeah, but I don't want to interrupt you, please. Um, so I actually lost my train of thought. What was the question you asked about? Oh, yeah, can, they, can, you, can you be both and they just yes. manifest themselves? So does anyone have an example of having both happiness and sadness at the same time? Graduation, right? Graduation, right? It's so beautiful because you're like, oh my gosh. Or if you graduate, you're like, I made it. And then you look around, and you're like, oh my gosh, I'm going to miss all my friends. You know, so you can have really high, and, and here's the thing that's interesting that I found in cancer care, which was kind of an early discovery in mood research as applied to cancer care, um, because physicians usually look at quality of life and, you know, other biological factors, and psychologists are more interested in this kind of mood stuff, which is, I get why they're not that into it, but I still think it's useful. Um, what I found in cancer care is Cancer patients, I expected that their negative mood would be really high and their positive mood would be really low because, you know, cancer is kind of a dread diagnosis. But what was interesting is their negative mood wasn't any different than a normal healthy population, but their positive mood was dampened, which makes them very vulnerable to things like depression and other things. So that positive mood kind of stays lower because you can imagine they're like, oh, I had a really great day, but I'm still fighting, like, you know, some serious illness and... There's a road in front of me. Yes, sir. Are they um, teaching, is it Ikigai? Are they teaching that in, or introducing that in corporate wellness programs? You know, I don't know where it's been used because I only discovered it because of my student this week. Um, so I really don't know the history of it. Um, but I imagine the application of it could be right. immense, right? So this is something I want to explore more with my students. Even the pitfalls, because you notice how some of them were like, oh, you could like feel like, Hopeful, but lost, or, you know? So those kind of pieces. Yes? Yeah, has anyone ever written a self-help book called Hedonics? That sounds like a great psychology book. So the most 
probably commercially successful and maybe the best one is called Authentic Happiness um, by Ed Diener. And he goes through different stages and there's a bunch of kind of fun stuff in it too. Um, but hedonics itself would actually be really cool. And, and you know what there is still, and, and with Riff and Diener, so Diener was like all about like subjective well-being and positive and negative affect. And what's great about that is it's great in studies because it's highly testable, it's really sensitive. When you start to get into these more ethereal concepts of like sense of purpose or virtue, it just doesn't come out on a questionnaire as neatly, you know? So they both have a place, but, um, but there's actually what was interesting. My boss, Dan Morozak, and my advisor for my dissertation, he, uh, he used to kind of revel in that they were on the same Midas study together, which is like a long-term study of American adults. And Riff and Dina were both in that and from two diametrically opposed positions, and they would like fight, fight. So shh, don't tell them I said that. But uh, <laughs> it was interesting to see like the encounter both, because I think you can have both. You know, I think you can have meaning and purpose and have pleasure and they can help each other. Yeah. Um, that's what I was going to ask, the role of like habit or exercise, because I was thinking of like, I was talking earlier, like my run group, right? Those people, when you see that Venn diagram, they get some of that externally. I don't know what's going on inside. Mm. That, the habitual, but the goal setting and that she like, it seems very... I was just trying to see its relation to like runner's high and those types of things. Yeah. Which is physiological, but also a mental thing. I think I'd be remiss if I didn't say like add the biopsychosocial, right? So you have the biological thing of just running and exerting exercise and all the good that that gives you. And that's like the most underused recipe for like curing depression, right? You know, it's like exercise. Um, and then the social piece, being a part of a group like this, you know, and savoring that kind of experience. I hope everyone hangs out a little bit so we can talk and meet each other. Um, the biological, and then the psychological, how you think and practice those habits of the mind. Like, I'm almost a little bit like, oh my gosh, if I hear this word one more time, but like being present. I'm just being present in the moment. And probably because I'm awful at doing that, you know? Like, it's just like a challenge for me. Or mindful, you know, like being in that moment. But, you know, ancient Eastern philosophy has been teaching this forever, and psychology is like, oh, yeah, maybe we'll try it, you know? So, yeah, great question. Anything else? Yes, sir. Um, earlier you were talking about, you know, just feedback on being extrovert or introvert. So if you're an extrovert, you're more sensitive to uh, positive messages. For example, you have a reward. Mm -hmm. So does that mean that an extrovert is also more sensitive to negative messages as well? Or are you saying being an introvert would be the other way around? Because I'm just thinking that maybe an introvert would have that uh, insensitivity to positive message, but also to negative messages. So maybe there's some good to being an introvert as well. Maybe you can kind of change your wavelength. So you are very sensitive to positivity, yeah. but then you are not that sensitive to negativity. So that, can, that way you can navigate life a little bit better because you have both positive and negative. I'm just wondering. So the channels are extroversion and introversion. That's one scale, right? And those are highly um, represented. And, and if you want to get deeper into this, like the neurobiology of it, my favorite is uh, Gray's reinforcement sensitivity theory. And what he did to test this theory was he would basically lie to every single person in the, the like this one, one group, and he'd say, you just won a, life, or a year's supply of this magazine, anyone you want. And then it's like, now get an MRI. Just stuff them right in there. And so then you would see their brains light up and they'd have more reward. Then what they do is um, they, they had a negative mood induction group. And this one was awful. And I, I don't know if I should say this, but I did it. And I didn't think it would work. And then it did, and I felt a little bit bad. Um, have you guys, so the original one was Old Yeller, oh. right? I don't want to ruin it for you, but <laughs> doesn't it well <laughs> for Old Yeller? And so anyway, it makes people really sad. So I was like, hey guys, on a scale of one to five, how happy are you guys? And you know, so it was a morning class, and everyone's like, oh, four or five, yeah, this is great. It's like eight o'clock in the morning. I'm like, you guys are psychos. You know, I don't understand how you're going to school so early. Then I put on the first five minutes of Up. <laughs> if you've seen it, if you know, you know. And it's this thing. And then I was like, so how you feeling now? And they're like, Dr. Tex, why? <laughs> right? And so it kind of went down for a second. But that's that idea with mood. So you need a couple different pieces. So the opposite of neuroticism, just to kind of frame it better, because that's more associated with negative affect, is emotional stability. And so my favorite thing, any character Larry David plays is like, <laughs> like the grail of neuroticism. You know, like 
it's just anything can bother him, and he just gets in these like small fights over things, and it's like that's neuroticism. You have a sensitivity to pain, you know? Yeah. Yeah, it, it's very interesting. You know, you have two people in a very a sad situation, like a funeral. Mm. One person be broken by it. The other person won't be in denial, but they could be saying, "Hey, we got to do this for Grandpa." They, they're they're goals oriented, and they 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 actually maybe even might be embracing the experience even just as richly and deeply. Mm. But they have they have a different, like Albert Ellis, rational emotive set of strategies mm -hmm. for dealing with the experience. So is this similar? Is this another way? Well, another way to kind of to kind of slide into this is my jealousy of introverts. So and if I see an introvert, they're just content. Ever see one? I'm reading a book. I'm not bothering anyone. Happy as can be. So my neighbor across the street, guy was like six foot seven. And I am not, right? So I'd see him from across the way and I'm like, hey Bob, Bob. He would run away from me because he's like, oh no, here comes the extrovert. <laughs> right? Terrified. And so introverts, you have everything in you to just be okay, right? Now the other thing that makes it more complicated for like grief and those other things would be like, you know, like your role in a family unit, you know, how close you were, how you kind of developed. So it gets complicated, but if you kind of get to the base level of just like on a typical day, how does an extrovert need to be okay? How does an introvert need to be okay? And like my wife's just complete introvert. She's fine, give her a phone, book, she's like good. And I'm like, hey, hey, what you doing? What you doing? What you doing? And she's like, what? Right? So, you know, it's kind of the way you flow. Yeah? I'm sorry, I get to start thinking. But, but I mean, emotions, in a sense, are very subjective, right? So, so when he's describing that, I could be just as broken, you know, at the funeral as another person. And, and you know, show you're, it. I'm a 10, and you're a 10. but. I missionary or I'm doing mm -hmm. this, but, but my experience, this is welcome to your world. Right? Well, you know, my you folks have to take is, personality psychology, which is coming up this fall, so that's where you'll get that. <laughs> you no, know, but no, I totally see what you're saying. And I want to validate your question. Um, yeah, they definitely they they might look a little different and it's subjective. And honestly, I mean, psychology is about a lot of surveys and we just ask thousands of people the same questions to see if we can make them reliable and valid. And then, you know, it's it's a soft science that's done with absolute rigor, you know? So like being able to test these things and, and look at it. Any other questions, folks? Thanks for being so generative. I really appreciate you. But I, oh yeah. What about the cultural aspects of happiness? I mean, is this so one thing I've just kind of gotten into a little bit in preparing for this personality class is Americans, if you look at traits, ocean, so openness, conscientiousness, we talked about you know extroversion, agreeableness, neuroticism. Americans really value extroversion um, and because and, and openness, right? So you're like, hey, this is who I am and I want to network and meet a lot of people. In something like Japanese culture, um, it's more of a collectivist society and you're, you're meant to stay in your group, right? So like your work team, your function, and you need to have a lot more agreeableness actually turns the dial of, of happiness better because you're expected to be in the same relationship for a longer period of time and you need harmony. So yes, they're absolutely cross-culturally different. And they actually just changed some of these to make them more universally applicable. So the trade theory of ocean has been changed to hexaco and so Hexaco, and honestly, I'm still just learning about this as I'm kind of like, oh, how did I miss this, you know? But it, it definitely looks at different kind of things, and it's a little bit more cross-culturally relevant. You know, so you grab those things, too. I think I'm getting a hook. <laughs> what? Okay, one more? Yeah, Jimmy so, Peters. So when you were showing the positive effect and the negative effect, it reminded me of a principle I had heard on a podcast about the granularity of your emotions mm. and that if you can because some people if you if you don't think about exactly how you're feeling you might navigate to oh um, I'm, I'm feeling terrible or I'm feeling great but um, um, if you're if rather than feeling terrible if you if you're able to truly identify uh, the emotion with finer granularity it won't be as bad. That's a great point. And something if you just Google um, circumplex models of mood, and you'll see like, you know, we have like 
mad, sad, glad, and afraid. Or like men, if you ask men like their feelings, they're like good, or I'm like wicked pissed dude. Right? Like we get two, you know, that we're like raised with. But then if you start to look at like all the different like high arousal, low arousal, and all those things, I like what you're saying, because then you can identify and name it. Because some people argue you can't think something if you can't have a word for it, right? So that cognitive element's there too. Anyway, folks, come and hang out with me. Let's get coffee. We'll talk some more. Thank you. Dr. Tex, you defined my heavy lifting of happiness. 350 words I have to put together for the scholarship teaching and learning team and tonight's presenters. That's my heavy lifting. Thank you. On a positive note, I want to share some incredible news about Quincy College. As you know, we continue to develop new opportunities for our students and the community. In the pa past year, we added Bachelor of Science in Business Management, then Bachelor of Science in Computer Science, and now we have just added a Bachelor of Science degree in Psychology. In this four-year program, you will get to work with Dr. Tex and other talented Quincy College faculty. So I'm sure everyone in this room uh, knows someone who would be perfect fit for this program. So thank you for spreading the word. And thank you very much for participating in this event. Um, if you have not signed up before, if this is your first time to this scholarly um, conversation event, please uh, sign up. Uh, Share your email with us, and we will include you on our distribution list for upcoming events. No spo spoiler alert, but we are planning a very exciting summer event, and we will let you know. Uh, before we all uh, adjourn for the orders and refreshments, I would like to ask you for one more round of applause for our tremendous speakers. Also, a round of applause for our staff from library, IT, marketing, PR, and facilities for their hard work for this event, and also QA TV for generously helping with recording and sound technologies. Once more, thank you all again for coming, and enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you.